Hello, and welcome to chapter four on prokaryotic growth. In this chapter, we're going to take a look at, um, at uh, the growth of bacteria over time. Uh, we're also going to look at different factors that affect growth, both in the laboratory and in the environment. So for part one of this lecture, in this part, we're going to talk about some principles of growth. We're going to look at how to calculate what's called a generation uh, time and number of generations. So we can look at how well at uh, bacteria are growing and at growth rates. So in principles of growth, one thing to always note is bacteria reproduce asexually through a process known as binary fission. They reproduce by dividing, and it is symmetrical div division. They will make a copy of their genetic material, their uh, plasmids, their uh, chromosomes, ribosomes, uh, sort those on either side of the cell, and then divide in half. Uh, this causes reproduction of bacteria to be an exponential process, and we'll see how that is used when we calculate growth curves. The time that is required for a cell to divide is known as a generation time. So every one of these uh, uh, divisions here, so here we have um, the first generation, right? So 1G, I'll just put for first generation. So this cell here went through these four steps here to divide and give us these two cells. Now these two cells are going to make generation two, generation three, generation four, and of course so on. So each time these cells divide, they create a new generation. And when we, uh, when we use the term bacterial growth, we are not talking about the size of a cell. We are actually talking about the, um, we're talking about the population of cells in a single environment in one place. So when, we, when you hear growth of bacteria, don't think size of cell. You want to think number of cells. We're increasing in population. So this brings us to what's known as a growth curve. Because bacteria grow exponentially, when we go through several generations, at first, if we were to graph this growth by the actual number of cells in a generation, you can see that our growth curve is kind of, kind of wonky. Right? It doesn't really start to show much until we get to around the 15th generation. So we have all of these generations that occur first, and we can't really see much or calculate it until we get to that 15th generation, and now we can start seeing some growth. And because of this exponential growth, it makes it difficult for us to determine a rate of growth. We can't determine a rate of growth with this type of curve, the straight line, right, the solid line curve, because we, can, we would have to calculate the rate over here. The rate is the slope of the line. So the rate over here is going to be much different than the rate over here. And again, that is due to exponential growth. So when we create a growth curve or a graph of growth, and we need to calculate the rate of growth of a population, we convert all of our actual generation numbers or numbers of cells into log base 10 values. By using a logarithmic value, we can then calculate a straight line. And when we calculate the straight line, we can then, of course, calculate the slope of the line. I'm sorry, it goes something like this, right? So we calculate the slope of the line, and that gives us um, the rate of growth, right? Change over time. So if we have this um, rate of growth, we have a much more consistent and much more accurate idea of how quickly a bacterial population may be growing. Now, in this course, I am not going to ask you to calculate the slope of a line. We do have to do a calculation known as a generation time calculation, but it does not involve the slope of a line. So uh, you can put away your algebra books uh, a little bit and uh, not worry about calculating a slope. So what is it that we are going to look at? Well, we're going to look at generation time. And your textbook has one way of calculating it. It has this formula here called n sub 1. So n sub 1 equals n sub 0 times 2n. And this is a pretty easy formula to use, right? So n sub 1 is, the, um, is what we use to talk about the number of cells in a population at a given time. So if we grew a culture of bacteria and we used a method to calculate the number of cells in that population, that would be our n sub 1. N sub zero is the number of cells that we originally started with. And this is because we uh, have to subtract those cells from our, uh, uh, we have to subtract those cells from our calculation. So we have to make sure that we know how many cells we started out with. So N sub zero times two N. 
and 2n, n is the number of divisions that occurred, or in this case, the number of generations. Well, this is all well and good if I know the number of generations, but if I don't know the number of generations, then I'm going to have a really hard time trying to calculate the actual generation time. And in the textbook, they're going to tell you the number of generations, so that number is going to be given. However, in the real world, you're not going to know that. You're not going to know how many generations have occurred. So we are actually going to use a different number of, uh, a different formula for calculating generation time that's much more accurate and is going to be useful to you outside of uh, this class. So this is an actually, I know it may sound like a more complicated way to do it, but it's actually easier. Um, and it is the, the method that is recommended. And you're going to have to use this for your exam. So I strongly urge you to practice this. All right. So for easier calculation, the first thing we have to do is calculate the number of generations. And we're going to use that generation number to then calculate the generation time. Again, this gives us much more accurate data, less original information. It also uses log base 10 values, which are really easy to use. Those are small numbers. Those values are going to be provided to you, so you will not be required to calculate a log value. So you don't have to calculate any log values. You'll be given a table. It'll have all of the numbers in it, and next to each number will be its log base 10 values. So you do not have to calculate any log values. So let's take a look at what this looks like. We'll do an example here. So the first thing we have is our question. So let's say that we inoculated a sample with 100 bacterial cells. We allowed it to grow for five hours. And at the end of five hours, using what's known as a standard dilution method or serial dilution method, we were able to determine that after five hours, that test tube now contained 1.7 million cells. Right, so that's the, this is the number that we calculated. In this particular formula, to calculate the number of generations, this must be done first. We're going to take the log base 10 value of the number of cells at the end of the growth period. So that would be the 1.72 million. Right? So I'm just going to write that down here. 1720320. Right? So that's the log. We want the log 10 of this number. We're going to subtract from that, that log 10 value, the log 10 value of the number of the cells that we started with, because we put those 100 cells there. They weren't already there, so we need to subtract that value. In this case, it, that is 100 and the log 10 value, right? So this is 100, that log 10 value happens to be two. We're going to, once we calculate the numerator of this equation, we're then going to divide by this value, 0.301. 0.301 is used because this is the log 10 value of 2, and this is because each cell actually results in two cells. Each cell division results in two cells, so we divide by this 0.301. 0.301 is a number that you're going to need to know. It's a standard. It's a given. It's always there. So what does this look like? Let me just erase my marks here. Uh, find my eraser pen and we'll erase that. And then I'm going to go back to my pen. There we go. Alrighty. So when we calculate this, if we have 100 cells growing for five hours, right, that give us 1.7 million cells, the log base 10 value of the 1.7 million is 6.236. My mistake is 6.236. My mistake. There's obviously issues here with uh, this PowerPoint. So 6.236. I'm going to subtract from that the log base 10 value of 100, which is 2. That gives me a final value of 4.236. I'm then going to divide 4.236 by 0 0.301. That's going to give me 14.073 uh, generations. So in five hours, these bacteria cells divided 14 times, created 14 generations. That's what this number is telling me. Now, I'm going to calculate. I always round to the nearest 10, so this will be 14.1. Now I'm going to calculate the actual generation time. So the number of generations is the denominator of this uh, equation, so I'm going to put 14.1 down here. I need to know how many hours. Well, it was 5 hours, and I have to convert and report this in minutes. So I, this is my hours. 
There's 60 minutes in an hour. I had five hours, so this come, becomes 300 minutes. I'm going to divide 300 minutes by 14.1. So when I do that, right, 60 times 5 hours is 300, divided by 14.073 generations, or you could round this to 14.1, and that's going to give me a value of, oops, 21 minutes, approximately 21 minutes per generation. You do have to report it in minutes per generation, uh, and that is why we convert our hours into minutes. So take a look at this, walk through it again. Um, a few times in the recording and on D2L, there will be a practice sheet up there for you. There's about six or seven practice problems, um, and we'll uh, take a look at those in class, and then you'll be able to practice the generation time to get ready for your exam. Now, another form of growth found in, um, uh, found in bacteria in the environment is in biofilms. So when bacteria grow in nature, they very often can form these biofilms. They're very common. We see them a lot in uh, surgical prosthetics, uh, skin infections, burn wound infections. Many bacteria create uh, this, this type of environment to protect themselves. So these are what are referred to as polymer and case communities. And what these bacteria do is they land on the surface. So in step one, the bacteria will attach to the surface. Could be bone, could be a surgical prosthetic, could be tissue. Uh, even out in nature and environmental microbiology, we see this on rocks and in streams and piping and those sorts of things. So the bacteria attach. They'll use their fimbriae or pili to attach. They attach to a surface and they begin excreting what's known as the EPS. Now an EPS is an extracellular polymeric substance. For some bacteria, this is very slimy and viscous, kind of like jello-y. For other bacteria, like the bacteria in your mouth, that create the biofilm known as plaque. Uh, that can also be, um, that's more like a concrete or chalky or uh, a, a much firmer type of uh, EPS, extracellular polymeric substance. This causes all of these bacterial cells to begin sticking together. And they create, inside of the EPS, they start creating this community. And these communities will grow. The more bacteria that get recruited to this, the more EPS gets created. And so the biofilm begins to grow in size. Now, this biofilm will contain more than just the original bacteria. So the biofilm population increases through recruitment. So other bacteria, different species, uh, yeast, fungi, uh, other organisms can enter and become part of this, uh, this biofilm community. Plus, the actual bacteria that began the community are usually the greatest in population because they will go through binary fission while they are inside the EPS. So the population of the original bacteria will grow as well. So we end up with this biofilm that's a really diverse community of multiple organisms, sometimes host proteins or cell debris, even um, if this were like in a... Uh, in a surgical prosthetic, host proteins can get recruited and pulled into this EPS as well. Eventually, the EPS is going to get very large and it will start to break apart. So pieces of it will break off. That's detachment here. So pieces of it are going to break off. And some bacteria will leave individually. When we have bacteria leaving individually like this, they're kind of swimming out there on their own. These are referred to as planktonic. Planktonic bacteria are bacteria that are Free, float, free on their own and are not uh, within an existing community at that point in time. So they're called planktonic bacteria. And what this does is this allows these bacteria to now move into other parts of the body. They can actually take EPS with them and get lodged somewhere or move somewhere else and start creating new biofilm. Now within the biofilm are these mesh-like channels that are used for the exchange of nutrients between bacteria and other organisms, as well as cell communication. And cell communication between bacteria is referred to as quorum sensing. Bacteria talk to each other, just like our own cells talk to each other, and they do this chemically. And so the chemical signaling that occurs between bacterial cells is referred to as quorum sensing. So biofilms oftentimes are harmful. Um, this is a, a video that's going to load in a few minutes here. Uh, biofilms are usually harmful, but not always. 
Uh, dental plaque is a form of biofilm. Uh, patients with cystic fibrosis will oftentimes get biofilm formation inside of their lungs by a bacteria known as Pseudomonas. That one is actually fairly deadly. The inside of catheters can form biofilms and um, the release, the detachment phase of that biofilm formation will cause some bacteria to move up the catheter instead of down the catheter and this can cause urinary tract infections. Uh, this is why catheters in the hospitals have to be flushed and changed on a regular basis. Of course, surgical prosthetics can uh, have biofilms form on them. And a big problem with that EPS is the EPS itself provides a lot of protection against uh, host cells, phagocytosis, the inflammatory response, different parts of the immune system. They can't get past that EPS. And so the bacteria are hiding inside of that EPS and none of our um, immune functions can necessarily reach them. So this oftentimes causes chronic low level inflammatory responses. So somebody can have chronic inflammation due to biofilm formation. The other problem with, um, with biofilms is that they are antibiotic resistant and it takes a exorbitant, a huge concentration of antibiotic to be able to penetrate some of these biofilms. And we can't necessarily give a patient that concentration of an antibiotic. It would destroy their kidneys or their liver. They can't process that high of a concentration. So uh, antibiotic delivery becomes contraindicative in that, in that case because these biofilms require such high, incredible levels. And some of them are just completely resistant. Uh, biofilms can also become a problem in water supply housings. Uh, plumbers actually are um, given instructions on how to prevent dead end piping so that biofilms do not start to form in the stagnant water in those uh, dead end pipes. Let's see if we can get this uh, can get this video to play here. All right, so this video is not working here, so I'm going to put a link to this in D2L so you can watch this video on your own. It's just a couple of uh, interviews of some researchers and doctors talking about the formation of biofilms. It is an important uh, video. It's only about seven or eight minutes long, so I ask that you do take a look at it and watch it. Uh, this ends part one of chapter four, uh, just talking about different forms of growth. In the next section, we are going to talk about uh, some factors, uh, different techniques that are used in the laboratory for growth and some different factors that um, affect that rate of growth. So I'll see you in part two.